Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to our Citrus Lunch Series. My name is Ken Goldberg. It's a pleasure to welcome you back here. And I want to tell you a couple quick announcements. First of all, welcome to everybody who's watching us over the web. And also that there's no I4 Energy seminar this Friday. But we do have, today at 4 p.m., a special event. It's going to be a, a lecture on an open source approach to global development from, U, from someone from USAID. Rajiv Shah will be here at the Sibley Auditorium speaking on that. And also remember that the Big Ideas competition is launched. So you have until November 6th, approximately uh, three weeks left to submit pre-proposals. So without any further ado, we are absolutely delighted to, to, to welcome Dale Doherty here to our campus. The, the maker, I, I've had the pleasure to watch the, this phenomenon evolve over the past, mm, what, 10, 20 years? No, eight. Oh, eight <laughs> years, okay. Well, it, but it's been phenomenal and it's taken off he, enormously. I just came back from the New York Maker Fair and in Queens, and it was it was it was packed to the gills. And there is an um, East Bay Maker Fair coming up next week. No, I think Sunday. Sunday. Okay, great. So there is tons of stuff going on. And if you don't know, I think everybody in this audience already does know about Maker Fair. It is a it is a it is a force of nature that is sweeping the world. And there's Africa Maker Fair, Makers Fairs, and others. Um, and it all started really with Dale. And I want to say he has, he, we, we have to say he also has a strong Berkeley connection. He actually has links with the iSchool, and we want to bring him back <laughs> to, uh, to the College of Engineering. He, is, uh, he, has, he was a publisher, an editor. He wrote two of the early O'Reilly books on Sed and Auk back in the day. When, in 1993, uh, when the web was just coming out, he um, developed Global Network Navigator first commercial website, in which it was sold to AOL. Um, he also was developer and publisher of Web Review, an online magazine for web designers. And he was the first, basically he and Tim O'Reilly co-founded um, O'Reilly Media together. And then um, he went on to come up with the, the idea behind Make Magazine and the Maker Fairs. So it's a division, um, Maker Media is a division of O'Reilly Media. And he's been instrumental. And one of his other great claims to fame is that Dale um, was the one who actually coined the term Web 2.0. So he's, he's so ideas are just popping out of his mind. I don't, and we're really excited to welcome him here and to find out um, from his perspective what's gonna what's gonna happen next. So please join me in welcoming Dale Doherty. Thank you. Hi everybody. Can you hear me okay? Good. Well, I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you, Ken, for the introduction. And uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to give somewhat of a general introduction to Make and Maker Fair. Um, I would guess that a lot of you know some of that. Um, I hope we can uh, get to some interaction at the end and, and let you kind of uh, go in, in new ways. But you know, I, I think one of the ways of characterizing making, and, and I put it in. Uh, um, uh, in, in sort of the summary for this is I, I think it is a way of looking at innovation and I think it's also looking at the future of education um, and I'll touch on a little bit of that today but let's kind of look at the the, the basic parts of it and I, I um, DIY or do-it-yourself is, is sort of at the core of uh, the magazine I started uh, and I wanted to apply that to technology and, I, and I've always felt like we've we have this enthusiastic community of, make, uh, of people, and I um, started using the word makers to identify them, but the primary characters is that they love to do what they're doing, and they want to share that, they want to tell other people about it. Um, and I, I think uh, what struck me, and, and it really is the origin of the magazine in a sense of the movement, was that I, it wasn't so much something personal to me, it was just really the observation of other people that I was encountering, these mostly adults, but I saw them playing with technology. And that's a word we often use with kids, but, and we don't take it very seriously. And by playing, I mean they didn't know what they wanted to do with a piece of technology. They were kind of exploring that. They were experimenting with it. They were taking, uh, they were trying to see what they could make it do. And I, uh, prior to make, I worked on a series of books called Hacks. Uh, like Google hacks and Excel hacks, and 
I was interested in a sense of how you're hacking something, uh, modifying something, what you wanted to get it to do that it wasn't necessarily made to do. And I, I had this idea, kind of coupled with this, that makers were hacking the physical world, or they, in the sense of the way that hackers were, were hacking software, we would apply that mindset more and more to things that in, our, in, our, in our world, such as spaces like this or cars. Um, but essentially, um, it, it, uh, rooted or grounded in the spirit of play. And I think this is something that, that kind of relates to the democratization of technology in general, whether it's software or hardware. But we're seeing this, you know, that amateurs and professionals are using the same tools. So makers are, are mostly amateurs. They're, they're, uh, but they increasingly they have access to a range of technology that previously you had to be a professional, or, or even more, you had to be in a corporate setting and have access to those tools in a lab or uh, other facility. But today we're seeing this democratization of fabrication so that you really can take an idea and make something yourself without a, a great deal of cost. It's not completely easy. There's still some obstacles, but there are fewer obstacles than there have been. And I think the most interesting thing, particularly, is that you can make almost one of you can make one of almost anything. And and in a sense, what making is probably less at this point a, a ch uh, like a manufacturing revolution and more like a prototyping revolution. It's possible to iterate cheaply and quickly, and uh, and in a sense we're making that very personal. Instead of like having an assembly line where you come up with an idea and you pass that on and that iteration happens in a, in a, a plant, you're able to do that yourself and learn from that and, and include that back into your design process. Yeah. Certainly 3D printing has been one of the technologies that um, it, uh, you know, is, is really taking off. Uh, it, it, it didn't really, it, it, it has existed for, in a commercial sense uh, really since about 1985. I find it kind of interesting that the laser printer and the 3D printer uh, really originate from 1985, around the same time the first patents for 3D printing uh, come from that period, uh, along with uh, um, uh, the, the laser printer. And if you think of the laser printer, really uh, gave rise to a kind of creative revolution of where creative people began to use computers for work that they did previously without computers. So it was just page design, but it gave rise to a generation of, uh, of new software, such as page layout, gave uh, rise to companies like Adobe with uh, languages like PostScript, which, which gave you kind of uh, independent interfaces to lots of different devices. You could kind of print on a, a small printer and a typesetter and get the same, uh, roughly the same result at different levels of quality. So 3D printing is, is something that's, that's uh, Obviously, it's on the cover of Wired now. It's, it's really uh, growing. This is a, um, but I think this is kind of what the maker's workbench looks like. This is from a, a, a student site at, at Georgia Tech. Uh, you know, we have something like, this is the egg bot over here, uh, just this small scale CNC on an, on an egg or a ping pong ball. You know, we have multiple windows doing 3D design. We have a 3D printer, but we, we still have, you know, uh, uh, screwdrivers and wrenches and other things, and, and we have Copy and Make magazine, which makes me happy. <laughs> but there's a, I think making is more than just a set of tools. It is a tool set, but it's also a mindset. And I, I think these are some of those attributes uh, that, that we see. Um, it tends to be more horizontal than vertical. It tends to be integrative across uh, people working across disciplines. Um, as, as I mentioned, a desire to kind of interact with the physical world, a mindset of playfulness. Uh, and, and I think there's an, um, uh, this is a, a group that has grown up in open source software communities and, and they're really trying to apply as much of those models, largely around sharing, uh, to, um, to making. If you think about the inventors, say 20 years ago or in the past, um, you know, the idea is to protect your IP, hold on to that, and that still may be a choice you want to make today. But the, in a sense, the default in the maker community is to share, and then worry about <laughs> what you want to protect. Um, uh, and then uh, finally, the, I think this sort of very optimistic or idealistic sense that the, the world can be improved, 
that things can be changed and, and made better. Um, so makers, uh, according to a recent poll we did with our, our readers and, and others, uh, a lot of them identified themselves as hobbyists. These, and that was part of the core idea uh, originally with the magazine, but I think it's starting to change a little bit. Um, a hobbyist is um, uh, someone who, uh, in a DIY sense, uh, dives into something because they, they love to do it. They, they want to learn how to do something. They don't necessarily have strong goals, but some of it is they meet other people through those activities. Identify themselves as tinkers, engineers, builders, programmers, um, and all the way down to cheapskates and other kinds of uh, uh, labels that they use. Um, the projects are pretty diverse, and I think this is what you see at Maker Faire, um, that uh, it really goes all over the place in terms of makers' interests. But I, I think one of the things that I've tried to shape in this is, is we could look at makers as a subset or a, a <laughs> subculture. And it certainly is not a mainstream thing today, but I, I believe that uh, it's something human in all of us to make. And we, we, whether we're gardening or cooking or doing uh, 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 electronic, uh, there's, it means something to us to make. And I, and I think part of our relationship with technology today is defined by using um, rather than making. And, and uh, I, I think part of what I'm after is, is this idea that we're not just consumers, we're not just users, but we can also be makers. Um, we can design, create, and build things. Um, this was once a more prevalent uh, attitude in our culture. This is a 1944 copy of Popular Mechanics, um, What to Make. Uh, and, um, you know, obviously it's sort of traditional uh, gender roles and things like that. I don't know whether that's a robe or a lab uh, thing. I can't quite tell, but um, a smoking jacket kind of thing. Um, but there was this wonderful sense in these magazines, and I had the idea for Make and went back and looked into them. In fact, the, you know, the trim size for Make is based on the, the copies of popular science from, from the 50s, and, and, uh, which, which were this size. But they had this idea that you, know, you could do this, that, that any technology that came along was going to affect you personally. And that you could, you know, if it was on a, a submarine, you're going to get to do that. So, um, and, and some of that is, is uh, kind of wishful thinking, but it's still uh, very engaging. And you know, I think some of the things that I found is that a lot of the projects that were popular 50, 60 years ago are still of interest today. We're still building you know, motorized uh, vehicles, uh, might be using shopping carts instead of this model. But, you know, look down here, make your own printed circuit boards. We had, an, we had that in um, uh, 2007 in Make Magazine. It was actually the same technique. I mean, we didn't know about the two uh, issues, but it was uh, using etching to create printed circuits. But uh, um, what I liked about these magazines that I felt I saw also in the hacker community was the sense of what's possible to do, <laughs> that it's, it's open and you can do it. Uh, it might, an uh, article in Popular Mechanics might be something like, you might think it's, it's too difficult to build your own garage over a weekend, but I did it and here's how. And I, that simple sort of how-to promises is what led to, to Make Magazine, to try to curate and collect projects across lots of different spaces. And, uh, you know, we really wanted to be about the details, about how to do it, not just that it was done or someone else created something. So we're, in many ways, looking for projects that were replicable uh, by um, other people. And I think in some ways we're trying to put a new face on making. Um, it is still largely a male audience, but we, we see uh, 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 more women coming in and, and other people. Um, it is certainly, if you go to a Maker Faire, see a, a, a vibrant, uh, diverse culture of uh, a, 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 a audience coming to it. So it's my hope that this is a, a new reframing of those things so we can invite everybody to play. Um, and then, so I think the rise of makers is, is somewhat well, this open source hardware model, which you may be reading about, personal fabrication tools, and, and, and this notion that makers are very well connected online today. That these provide new tools for creative expression and I think new business opportunities. And 
in many ways, uh, Brie Pettis and MakerBot uh, uh, represent the pinnacle of it, at least in the maker community today. Uh, maker Fair started in the Bay Area in 2006, and I really, really just had the idea that it would be interesting to bring people together who are making things, in, in almost like a science fair, craft fair, art fair, show what you're doing. And this is, a lot of the DIY projects are hidden in people's garages and basements, and they're, they're not visible to each other. So um, I had no idea, really, that that many people would be interested in this. I thought the makers would enjoy meeting each other. And I, one of the, I, I think, uh, choices or framing uh, of this that somehow worked is that it really didn't matter what your project was. You could still get together and talk about those projects, uh, whether you were doing embroidery or electronics. You could still ask the same kinds of questions, like how did you get the idea? Where did the materials come from? What's the process? How long did it take you? And people like to talk about that. They like to share the details behind their work. And so um, Maker Faire has you know, fun, interesting things like the, uh, Russell the robotic giraffe, uh, our uh, electro, uh, electric cupcakes and muffins. And uh, this one was from uh, Maker Faire Soul. Uh, beautiful uh, uh, dolphins, uh, all controlled with an Android phone, and you could uh, set the timing and other things. But you know, beautiful physical interaction, um, and, and uh, I, I wouldn't have known that was in the community unless we had the fair. But a lot of it is designed uh, such as these are cycle side rides. They're pedal powered, so you have to get on and make the ride work rather than have a motor drive it. Um, and it is appealed to, to, to kids. Um, I think the interesting thing is we kind of figured out we couldn't organize uh, very many maker fairs ourselves. Uh, it's exhausting. Um, they were growing in scale and size. The, this year in the Bay Area, uh, we reached about 110,000 people. Um, during the uh, weekend, and uh, in New York, we just finished at 55,000, which is up from about 35,000 the year before. So there's sort of growing interest, but people want to go to a Maker Faire. They want their community to have a Maker Faire. So we began to, in a sense, open source Maker Faire. We provided a playbook, uh, and we provided a process where you could sign up and organize your own Maker Faire. And this year, we'll have over 60 Maker Faires around the world. Uh, and many of them are very small. There are a couple thousand people. Um, this, this weekend's Maker Fair is, is, is not particularly small. Um, I think it's a reasonable size, uh, five to 10,000 people. It's at the Park Day School in Oakland, and it's sort of used as a school fundraiser. But it brings all kinds of people together um, and uh, gives them an opportunity to share their work. So, I, but I think that, I think I, I, I wanna sort of come back to, and what I try to tell people about the fair or the book, it's fun. I mean, the, the reason people go is because it's a fair. It's, it's not, uh, we're not trying to educate them in, in the general sense. We're not trying to make them do something. We want them to have fun. And, uh, uh, and we're not trying to necessarily get them to even uh, adopt any ideology. Uh, we do think they, they become makers because they're inspired to participate. We designed it for families. We really did not want to have a geek event that was like a, uh, you know, an all night convention um, that had uh, just the, sort of the hardcore there. We wanted to see um, uh, kids in strollers and other things coming along, and that's one of the reasons we chose the fairgrounds to do it. Um, for makers, it's, it's a deadline, um, and it, but it's not, um, we've kind of distinguished Maker Fair from competitions and challenges a lot, which usually not only have deadlines, but they also have um, uh, rules and they have outcomes and prizes. Um, I wanted to see what people were doing, not what I wanted to see them do. So I tend to avoid, and when people come, hey, can you get a group of makers to do this? And I go, well, go out and see if you can find makers doing that. And that's my orientation towards this, is not to direct the community, but to really provide a venue for seeing what the community is doing. We tend to stay away from themes and other things, because it, it uh, you know, some of the, the work that I see out there, just like say in robotics, I'd almost love to see what would happen if we removed the rules and allowed um, lots of different entries to come in and uh, uh, go in different directions. I'm really interested in this intersection of creativity and technology, um, not just uh, what it, uh, you know, the functional sense of technology, but also sort of the creative application for it. And I think where we've seen 
I think the biggest role, and, and maybe you, you don't see it unless you're in the middle of it, but uh, put on a Maker Faire is really like community organizing. It's going out and looking for all those groups, the amateur astronomers, the, the locavores, the um, uh, robotics uh, after school groups, and trying to knit them all together and understand why they would come together. And what's interesting is I believe they begin to see a connection between their work and other groups. Uh, you know, if you think of groups as somewhat being siloed, this allows them to uh, make those connections and see themselves as part of an overall community. And uh, I would say it's, it has, uh, uh, you know, become a movement, uh, whether I like it or not, it's, uh, that's kind of what it's, it's referred to. And you know, I think it, the best that I can sort of use to describe it is sort of a, a sense of participatory culture and, and uh, you know, around creative communities and the kind of work that people are doing. Um, they want to share, they want to get together. And this is as old fashioned as the county fair. Um, it's as old fashioned as the English fair where people lived on remote farms and wanted to get together and talk about figs and pies and things they do, they do uh, uh, you know, uh, apart from one another. But I think partly what the driver for this new interest is a sense of, uh, uh, of what the internet offers in interconnecting communities. Uh, um, we often have a sense that we can, uh, well, let me phrase it this way. What I think is unique today, if we realize it, is that we can build our own communities and we can join more than one communities. The tools like social media really allow us to build purpose-built networks that you say, I'm interested in this. And someone who's interested in uh, uh, you know, DIY drones can organize a community around something like a product or, or even uh, a, a body of code. Um, a lot of our communities are fixed, or maybe where we went to school or where we grew up. But we're, we now have tools to create interest-driven networks. And I think that's what we see underlying the, the, the maker communities that you can, you're not limited to even a professional community. You can go join uh, communities. And I think another way we see this sort of the open source nature of making is actually not in a digital sense, but in a physical sense of creating maker spaces, hacker spaces, fab labs. Uh, I'm using the term somewhat generically. But uh, having physical spaces where you can get together and make, um, this is from Artisan's Asylum in, in Somerville, Massachusetts, and it's someone's cube in a sense in a bigger uh, facility, but people may have their own personal space in, in addition to shared space. Uh, I think the original make hacker spaces were more club-like, and it was a small group of people, such as Noise Bridge in San Francisco, that got together with shared values and, and uh, uh, wanted to, um, you know, kind of share a lease on a, on a building, uh, create the space, build it out, and have access to, to tools and, and equipment. Um, this is a Dallas maker space, and I visited that in March, and I was just really impressed by the variety of it. It has about 80 members, and it was really much bigger than just a small club. They, they you know, had governance. They had uh, organization to figure out how, wh how they would acquire new tools or how they would make certain decisions about um, the sp how the space was organized. But what I see at these places is, is also really interesting projects coming out there from um, collaborators who meet each other through the hackerspace. This is, comes out of uh, level one hackerspace in Louisville, Kentucky, and it's a white star balloon project. Uh, you know, the hackerspace itself got launched because a couple uh, people from, that, uh, from Louisville came to Maker Faire, saw the other hackerspaces, went back and created, and then a separate group who went and used the hackerspace started, uh, one guy had this idea for, uh, you know, a, a cross-Atlantic uh, robotic balloon crossing that he wanted to do, and he was able to find other people at the hackerspace to help them do that. And uh, so, um, uh, interesting project. This is from the Dallas Makerspace, uh, biofuel cells. This, the picture on the right is they were growing fabric uh, from, from bacteria and putting it in small layers, and they hoped to make a dress out of it. So it's, it, in many ways, it's, it's kind of like an open R&D lab, you know, these, these places. And I don't think we, we quite know enough about them, uh, what, how they're organized and what makes them work. Uh, even what some places have really good community and others don't. Others uh, have really good organization and others are, are really chaotic and they, they fall apart after a while. 
But the other thing I kind of want to mention is, is uh, I, I, partly because of the number of kids that, comes to make, that come to Maker Faire, I've been fascinated by what this means for them. Uh, and re really, how do we engage more kids, uh, young people, in making? And uh, one of the ways we this summer produced a, uh, a, our first kids issue, a schools out issue, um, and I, I put some on the back table there, and, and really trying to um, feature projects that you could do around the house and do with your friends. And um, I, I think it's, it's uh, we just see a, a lot of interest. I was, uh, another project we did this summer was uh, Maker Camp online with Google Plus, and it was a virtual summer camp where we had, for six weeks, a, a different project. We had someone uh, coming in through a Hangout, a uh, Google Hangout, and showing what they did and how to make it. And it was really fascinating. Uh, we had, uh, you know, the number of participa participants was amazing. We started off with something like 3,000 people following the, the Make page, and we were over 800,000 by the time that, that uh, camp finished. So a lot of people. Um, using the, the Hangouts to extend it. But, you know, we don't really see the maker movement into schools, and, and, and there's ways that we don't appreciate, I, I think, what is going on here. Um, you know, we used to have this sort of mental model, here's manual labor, here's mental labor, you know, and, and uh, you know, the old shop class was uh, a representative of manual labor, and, and more abstract thinking happened over here. Um, I like Howard Gardner's phrasing of this. I think it speaks to what makers do. Um, the intelligence is the ability to sort of create products and, and, uh, or to solve problems that span one or more contexts. And I think it's in a, the simplest sense. It's like bring, making something at home, but bringing it to Maker Faire, and you introduce it to other people, and they say, oh, that's cool. I like it. Um, there's also this, this older definition of invention that I really like. It establishes relationships that did not previously exist. I miss the idea of mashups. But I think a lot of what you see, in a sense, is walking around a maker fair and say, you know, that's going on there and that's going on there, but nobody's making those connections between the two things. That's what I would like to do. And I, I think uh, one of the things I've been arguing, uh, uh, in a sense, about making in an educational context is that it creates evidence of learning um, when you ask about assessment. That the project itself, the work you've done, this is a young man doing a soldering exercise at a Maker Faire. But this is evidence of what you can do. It speaks to you directly. It has value to you, that, that evidence. But it's also something you can share uh, in the Howard Gardner sense with other people out of that context. So I'm looking at ways to um, offer more hands-on experiences. Um, and in education, we have some programs I'll, I'll just tell you about in a minute, but in a way, a, a lot of science education, or STEM as it's called today, is, it's, it's, it's a national priority. But I don't think we often understand why it should be a priority, other than we think there's a workforce and, and other things there, nor do we understand really what leads kids into this. And my own observation is in talking to scientists and talking to engineers, um, when you ask them, how did you get into what you were doing? What, what were the formative things that drove you? It, it is more often than not experience rather than content that drove them there. It wasn't, I read this great book and then I wanted to do something. It was, I had this experience. I had a chemistry set. I blew things up in the backyard. I went out in the backyard and found these bugs and I was curious about why they behave that way. And so in many ways, I, I, I think, we need to drive a push to more experiential forms of education or learning that um, are uh, available to kids. And I think making is one of the ways to do that. I also think that making has a broader appeal to kids for whom the academic tracks don't necessarily click. So that we actually have a way through making to bring more people into these fields that would otherwise feel excluded. Which I think would be not just a good social goal, but I think it would be transformative for those fields to have their expertise and insight. So put into a phrase, is, uh, what I'm kind of interested in with kids is what can you do with what you know? How do you frame it that way as opposed to just giving them lots of information? Um, and, and often starting from the point of view, there's a lot they can already do. When they show up day one, they, they can uh, uh, start making. They can see materials, they can see tools and begin doing things. Um, there's a, uh, 
a specific program. I've gotten DARPA funding to do this mentor makerspace program, a partner other lab, <laughs> and uh, really trying to uh, create physical and digital workspaces in high schools. And in some ways, you could say revitalizing a shop class, although I'm not necessarily trying to align with some of the older goals of shop class. But it is a place to, to do things get, um, and, and make things. We're interested in lower cost options. In a sense, trying to take the makerspace idea and bring it into schools. But we can't um, spend a lot of money doing that. We can, we're looking at more organic, bottom-up approaches with low cost tools and, and hardware. Um, but our overall goal is to reach 1,000 schools over the next three years. And, uh, um, uh, and, and finally, I just want to mention this, this sort of every uh, child of makers, a nonprofit we set up this summer, uh, Dr. Amory Thomas is running it, really to promote um, um, this sort of m uh, engagement uh, around making for, for more and more children in, a, in community settings. Uh, we'll be working with partners like science museums and boys and girls clubs to uh, help them develop the capacity to teach and engage kids in making. So um, I'm going to read this quote um, and see if any of you know where it's from. I, I saw the quote actually on a West Sacramento High School uh, bulletin board. The teacher had typed it up and put it up for them. But in many ways, it expresses, I think, the maker mindset better than, than anything I've seen. And um, Anybody guess where it's from? Someone's whispering it. Say it louder. Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs. And, you know, this idea that, you know, I just say, if we could get this across to kids, that the world was made up by people no smarter than you, you know, that this is open for you to, to change and to do things. It's not all been done. It's wide open. So let's invite them to, to come in and build things and make things. You know, they had much the same spirit, I think, at the, the beginning of, of uh, uh, the personal computer revolution as we're seeing in the maker and going to the homebrew computer club. But what I like to, let me go to this, what I like to sort of say is, this is what the first Apple computer looked like. This is what you, you know, this is the prototype. This is the rough edged, made of wood, borrowing a, a, a you know, a socket, uh, missing keys. It's just meant to suggest that what you could do is build a real computer. And what I think we're seeing in makers today is this level of prototype. We're not seeing where they may end up. So, um, uh, but being able to get to this place is terribly important and terribly valuable. So thank you very much. Um, any questions, thoughts? There's a question over here. So I have two questions for you. Sure. Um, first one, this makerspace thing, how do I get involved? Okay. Um, second one, it seems interesting to me that this seems like a repeat of history. This is sort of pre-guild manufacturing and learning. Do you think it's going to go down the same path, and do you think it should? Well, wh which history are we talking about? So I'm talking like, just so in general with guilds or... So if you go back to before we had organized, uh, organized sets of people who did jobs specifically, right. people built their own stuff. Mm -hmm. So now we've got all the communication in the world, but it seems that you're going to see a consolidation of types of building eventually. There's going to be a consolidation. So yeah. how is that going to fall out, do you think? Um, I'm terrible at predicting the future. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's interesting to figure it out. I think when we say the history, that's why it's kind of actually like the personal computer. Uh, you know, we, we have this, this period in time where, where people from outside industry, in a sense, are creating this new thing. And they're creating personal computers because they just want to have them one themselves. And they don't have a goal of creating an industry, but an industry grows up around that. Um, I think guilds and things are interesting to study. I don't know what uh, completely this, um, you know, will, will this reinvent cottage industries or, or things like that? I, I probably not, but I think it just, it's, it's sort of like it's extending our capabilities as individuals, and I don't really know where that, that leads yet. <coughs> and come up and talk to me about the makerspace afterwards. I'd be happy to connect you on that. 
You should have used Alan Kay's quote, the best way to predict the right. future is make it. Right, absolutely. And you guys, have done, a, yeah. you guys have done a really good job in going that way. We actually have a startup now that's using your maker 3D printer to do a, a startup company, which is right. a really great example of how you see people with technology. Right. And I'm so glad you brought in the thing with the 3D desktop publishing, because that caused a whole new revolution. And I know what you guys yeah. see about creating the, the whole 3D uh, world and, and yeah. But that's an interesting point too, and, I, and maybe gets back to your question a little bit. Is, you know, at some point in, in the future, we'll be talking about not three. We'll we'll be talking not about 3D printers, but the amazing businesses and, and things that people did with 3D printers. This is sort of having those early laser printers gave us, uh, you know, a, a, I mean, that's how O'Reilly became a book publisher. We could print our own computer manuals, and we started doing that. But um, uh, what's what's interesting to look in the future is what do people do with these tools? Not just create more tools, but actually apply them in interesting ways. Hey, yeah, thanks for the talk. Uh, I guess I have a series of related questions. So first is, do you think people want to start having access to more advanced tools, like for example, CNC tools? Um, how would you have wide access to that in a cost-effective way? And then what might that imply for making becoming mainstream or not? So, are you are familiar with Tech Shop in San Francisco? So that's one way these tools become familiar, become available. That's like a gym. Um, instead of having it, all that equipment at home, you go somewhere and pay $100 a month. Um, now that doesn't necessarily make it widely accessible to everybody. It's still a, a, a membership. Uh, but that's why I think some of the important things of schools and community centers and boys and girls clubs can begin making some of this technology available um, accessible to more people. Uh, I think having, m my basic idea is we need more and more kinds of spaces out there to, to make it accessible. It won't necessarily, the right answer isn't necessarily everybody will have it in their you know, living room. Uh, uh, I think the things we're seeing today, so you, you not only need access to the tools, but you need access to a community who has, can help you train uh, um, uh, to use that, that tool. Is that good enough? Yeah, thanks. Anybody else? Do we have any other questions? Yeah. Yes, hello. I work a lot with people who don't actually build product prototypes, but service prototypes. Right. And they always look at engineers uh, full of envy because they can't show what it's going to be like. Do you have any suggestions for people who are actually making inventions in the field of services rather than products. Give me an example. I mean... Um, New healthcare models, for instance, and you don't have um, a product you can look at, uh, look at and, and demonstrate. It's actually more ideas, and so mostly they put up posters what it's going to look like, yeah. and that's very boring to look at. Yeah. Well, I think that's sort of paper prototyping is kind of <laughs> the, and verbal. Um, but what I, I, I'll give you this, it's not really your, an answer to your question, but one is Jose Gomez Marquez at MIT is, is working in the health area and has largely been working in places like uh, Guatemala and looking at the use of medical equipment, usually secondhand equipment that comes down to, say, South America. And they have to hack that equipment because when it breaks, uh, the, there's no one to call, but they have to figure out. So they, they're almost embarrassed that they're good at hacking this equipment to make it work. And sometimes it's, it's, uh, it's adapting technology that, say, it's electric and it works everywhere in the West, but down there they have to take it into a mountain village and, and replace a, a nebulizer with a foot pump um, rather than electric. So he started designing um, DIY medical equipment that was more components that you could put together to create those devices. And uh, uh, so, uh, his, his thing is like a suitcase of things that, that people put together to, to, um, uh, for, for that same audience of nurses and practitioners. But I don't know if any, I, that's, that, that's just a health-related example of, of making, but I'm not sure on the service side of it, um, you know, where, where there isn't a, a physical or tangible, but so, I guess what I'm getting, in, in sometimes services are expressed through devices or some kind of interaction with the device. And, and being able to create and prototype that device also helps you understand the service you can provide. Ken? 
Theo, I, I'm, I'm just uh, love that this is spreading so fast and there's all these new developments and I think that the 3D printer just seems to be like the perfect new innovation technology that seems to have enormous effect. Right. I'm curious about, um, because we're right now, the College of Engineering is undergoing our APM accreditation process and the big thing that keeps coming up is the issue of design. So they really want to see us incorporating design into all the courses and, and so, much of the, so much of the curriculum. And I'm curious about if you've thought about how this would, the, the kind of ideas you're talking about could fit into curriculum on college level or, or let's say college level courses in particular. And then if you could also maybe touch on how you think this might be connected with the, um, this new phenomenon of massive online open courseware. Yeah. Well, Alex could probably talk about design too in the scope. Um, uh, let's see, a couple. Well, I, you know, I, I mean, I guess the primary thing I, I see when that, that slide I showed of Georgia Tech is uh, they created a, what they call an invention studio, which is a student um, run maker space. Uh, they originally set up for the capstone projects for probably like senior year. What they found is that students were using it r as soon as it opened for all kinds of purposes. I mean, something that they needed for their car, and they had maintenance workers coming in and using it, and other people on campus wandering in. They actually set up a student club, a maker's club, to, uh, to administer the space in terms of like you're a new user coming in, we're going to show you how to use the, the CNC machine. Um, and, and so it's, uh, it, that's a, a kind of a different attitude. Uh, it became a social space where the, they came to do their homework but they got to meet other people and see other work that was going on. So it, it, in many ways I, I would like to see maker spaces used at colleges like libraries are, they're wide open, they're not just departmental resources, they're something that you might use for a variety of purposes. And isn't it a good thing that you might do a personal project in that space that you're learning on your own to do something that, that, that you, you care to do? So, um, and, and I think a lot of what happens in those spaces is peer-to-peer -peer, uh, sharing of expertise rather than here take a class in, in the 3D printers, let's go see what someone else is doing. Um, uh, des let's see, sort of the design, and uh, Alice, w w you know, I see the design in here, but what I'm, I would come at this is, like, I'll give you an example from a kid's camp that we did this summer. Um, it, we naturally design, <laughs> like, we, we naturally try different things. Um, what I sometimes worry is we want to teach a formal process to, to everybody, that like, this is how to do design, rather than the experience of design, and say, like, just getting in that mindset, well, this could be, be different. The kids are doing the compressed air rocket thing. And so if, you, if, if the project's defined as, as typical science curriculum, is build your rocket and launch it, and it's done. Right? What the kids want to do is, hey, my rocket went this way. Yours spiraled up and did something else. If you do it again and again, they get a chance to iterate through the designs that they see coming from each other. And so uh, I, I would just encourage that we do more experiential kinds of things that allow you to go through. Uh, and you can get better at a process, but once you kind of have an, a sense that, um, I, 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 I'm a writer, so I gauge it back to writing. Like, it's the same kind of thing of iteration, of just once you get the idea that writing requires rewriting, you are a better writer. <laughs> you know, and so, uh, you know, that a design requires thinking about the design and, and doing more than one of them uh, makes you a, a better at that. I'll see what we, uh, could, yeah, you well, have a microphone. Ken and I probably talked about this quite a bit. By the way, they're, they're moving all the books out of the basement, uh, first floor of Moffitt, and trying to make it into a new space, so maybe we can work on that space. There, there's, there's space, this is with a, a number of colleagues, but to have a kind of maker space in, in the building here, and there's courses going on that are trying to push on a lot of these topics that I think Dale is reaching out and just making accessible equipment and accessible skill sets beyond strictly just College of Engineering, but kind of bringing in practitioners with these problem-solving approaches that are uh, kind of really fascinating to society in general. Design is the, uh, the segue canon and, and even accreditation in engineering. We, we started this human-centered course design threads to get non-engineering students involved in, in design and, and I think that will change the face of engineering and people that are involved in, in design. Yeah, I would say that, you know, the, 
The only troubles I've had sometimes with design is, is sometimes that's the exercise on its own. It never leads to actually making. And, and I, I think we, we learn about design and we learn about what we're doing by making the thing and, and engaging with it. And actually, you know, sharing it and exposing it, something like a prototype to real people. One last question? Yeah, there was that book by Cory Doctor of Makers, yeah. and which describes some kind of a future. Could you say a little bit more about the, the political boundaries of what you're trying to do um, where in terms of uh, providing alternatives to, to mass industry? And yeah. How far can this go? And well, I, you is know, it really empowering, or is it just a hobby? I'd be happy if it was just a hobby, to be honest. I think it is empowering, but I... I'm sort of apolitical ar ar around this. That I, I think things like DIY carry with them a set of ideas and values. And when you begin doing things yourself, you feel that way. But I, I don't want to do the other thing, which is say, do them because you want to acquire these values. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I don't, um, uh, I, I, I think it provides uh, all of us with alternatives. And, and, and I think that has just culturally that, you know, that makes us richer and more interesting. Um, where I would see th things that, uh, um, at a recent conference, a, a hacker from Tokyo, Akiba, uh, you know, as a group after the Fukushima disaster, um, you know, realized that the information they weren't getting from the government about radiation levels it wasn't accurate, you know, that wasn't complete. So they couldn't get their own Geiger counters, so they had to go out and design them and make them. And then they put them on cars and started sweeping large areas of the north to get better readings. And uh, they published those online. And you know, it's just a, a really wonderful example, I think, of the connection. I don't know whether they call it social or political, but I'd call it more social activism in, in pursuit of uh, you know, uh, uh, so, sort of human values there. Um, I'm not that interested in sort of political agendas uh, around this, but uh, from the left or the right, but <laughs> so we have enough division there. So I'm trying to, um, but I, I think it is stuff. You know, when you give people tools, they can do things they aren't able to do previously. So, uh, and a mindset to do that. So thank you all for coming today, and uh, I'll hang around here if you have any specific questions. Thank you.